peace of Christ to all in this video we will uh, show you uh, you know some more of uh, Muhammad uh, secrets and uh, the standards of Islam because you know Muslims they always try to present themselves that they are people who wear white clothes pray five times a day uh, their women are decent uh, Islam is against adultery all these uh, things which is absolutely have nothing to do with the value of Islam and Muslims in this uh, uh, in this hadith in the front of us and this is the book of Sahih Muslim Sharh al Nawawi and we can read actually uh, this is islamweb.net and this is this one is the official government website of Saudi Arabia official government website and the one who is the minister of Saudi Arabia for Islam he is the one in charge of this website so this is no kidding and this is Sahih al-Bukhari uh, Sahih Muslim Bishrah al-Nawawi sorry Sahih Muslim Bishrah al-Nawawi and here we will see that uh, page number 348 this hadith is speaking about something very very disgusting now Muslims for sure they try to cover like, the shame in this story in here and they try to make it look totally different and uh, because I know most of you do not know Arabic anyway so what we will do uh, we can post uh, the hadith underneath of the video and you guys you can translate the link in Google translation but we will read for you uh, a translated version of this hadith to English so let us see together what this hadith is speaking about we can uh, find this hadith translated already for those who speak English only in investigateislam.com uh, if we go in here and we read and for sure the site is showing you the link this is actually an old link for the hadith should be updated but anyway uh, you will see in here the translation for this hadith as the following actually you know what I'm not going to waste my time I read for you all of you you know good English and even maybe better than me uh, you can read the hadith by yourself and you will see that speaking about Muhammad he is having sex between something have four legs now the Muslims have they, they will say to you or four parts you know the Muslim will say to you this is not about uh, animal this is about women but you know women don't have four parts I never heard of that uh, four legs uh, but however uh, the word in here is used is shi'abuha shi'abuha al-arba the four branches shi'ab can come as a branches now hands you know hands are not branches and they cannot be count as uh, like or we can't say four hands between her four hands because human have only two hands and we cannot say four legs because a human have only four legs so those have to be something from the same kind the same equality uh, either, either four hands and that is impossible or four legs and that is possible if the creature is an animal now the Muslim they will say the story in here about Muhammad having sex with the, uh, something have four branches and after that he wash is not about an animal first of all my question to Muslims is what kind of books those books is telling us you know what Muhammad was having sex with and what he do with his penis after he finish um, uh, you know if you think about it this is telling us that Islam is a really trashy low-class religion but to prove our point that Muhammad he was having sex with animals then we need to read the explanation of this hadith which is made by Muslims made by Muslims not by us and this is the, uh, the interpretation of the hadith made by Sharh al nawawi the Imam al nawawi one of the biggest uh, scholars in Islam and this is the hadith commentary translated to English as al nawawi he said you see it those are not my words now if we read you know you will see really ashamed ash a shameful uh, uh, story and you will see that the Muslims themselves are confused about what Shi'abu al-Arba mean 
um, four sides of uh, the mean the arms and the legs uh, while others say is the fair to legs and tied, thigh, thigh and the other uh, means legs and edges I don't know, it is really, it, it's, a, it's a disaster but now let us go to the meaning of this hadith or the interpretation of it and we will see the following and read with me please, those are not my words <coughs> those are the Muslim interpretation words our companions have said that if the panel head has been traded, and they are talking about the penis, when it traded a woman anus or a man anus. Look with me. A woman anus or a man anus. You know, I don't know what to say. Because why a Muslim want to explain to us about what to do with your penis after having sex with a woman anus or men anus unless it is accepted in Islam to do so because remember the whole story in here is about washing your penis before you have uh, before you pray so those are good believing women and men and Allah uh, Apostle he is teaching them what to do after you use your penis hmm? or a woman use even a penis and you will see later with the woman anus or a man anus or an animal anus, animal's uh, vagina or its anus. Like this is really getting getting weird, huh? So the Prophet in Islam in here teaching us, and the, the Muslim they will say, hey, hey, the, the, this is not the Prophet talking, this is the Imam. It doesn't matter. The Imam is explaining what your Prophet he meant to say. This is your scholar, he's explaining what the Prophet he wanted to say. And the, not only that, this is the companion, which means the majority of Muslims agreement about what this about it's not about one person only so animal vagina or its anus that's really amazing what a high standard religion and we continue because the story is not uh, is not done yet we will see in here it says uh, it is necessary to wash whether the one being penetrated is alive or dead <laughs> what hold on a second women anus men anus animal vagina and its anus whether it is alive or dead young or old that's really amazing even dead one most never they want to have sex with Actually, all of us, we knew the story about Muhammad sleeping with uh, Fatima bin Asad, the mother of Ali, in her grave. And Muslims, they say he did not have sex with her. Then I want to ask them, he slept with her for what? She's in the grave. And he, you know, he supposedly she was naked and he closed her. He, he took his, his clothes and he covered himself and her with his clothes. The Muslim, they will say, to make the pressure of the, uh, the grave lighter. Huh. Ah, lighter. Uh, okay, so I sleep with a woman in the grave. That will make the pressure of the grave lighter. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So in here we will see that Muslims are teaching their fellow Muslims that you can have sex with the anus of a man and animal, dead or alive. And we continue. The story is not over yet. Uh, if we go down here a little bit, you can read the whole story actually. I'm going to post for you the link underneath of this so you can read by your own. I don't want to say enjoy because uh, I don't think you guys you will enjoy it that much. It's disgusting. But to make the story short, look at the end of the uh, interpretation what it says. And here actually it's so talking about if uh, a man he warp his penis, penis with the uh, etc. You know, it's it's disgusting. I don't know what's what what's wrong with this religion. Uh, and and then they say to you, the song of songs is poor. And and in the same time, they found the name of Muhammad in the song of songs. This is why no Muslim now is speaking about it as poor no more, which is weird, right? <laughs> Hypocrite nation. Now, if a woman insert in her vagina, what what what? what? If a woman insert in her vagina. Women inserting a Muslim woman, she is inserting her vagina. What she is inserting? Uh, let me guess: a banana? No. Cucumber? No. A pen? No. An animal's penis? Uh oh. 
she must wash and if she insert a detached penis wow man Muslim women they are going going high tech detached penis which means they are cutting the penis of a donkey or a cow or I don't know or a dog or even a, a, a man ذكرا مقطوعا which means a cut it off penis uh, you know like I don't know what to say and look what they are saying they are talking about the majority of the two opinion there's two opinion the most correct one is the one saying she must wash so all what this is about is the important thing in the whole story in here if the Muslim women she must wash or not isn't it, isn't it amazing so Muslim women she can use an animal penis detached penis she cut off a penis of a donkey, a monkey, uh, or whatever she inserted in her vagina but the important thing is you Muslim women you should learn that a sister you should wash your vagina after you have sex with the detached penis or Zakran Maktuan it's very very beautiful religion take care of every case every problem today a Muslim woman she will not be confused because of this if she use a penis of a donkey or a horse or anything because she knew what she should do after that before this story being given to her her vagina was confused and might stay dirty now mashallah uh, and by the way uh, remember there's two opinion which mean maybe maybe let us say there's 400 million uh, Muslims they say uh, we, she should not wash and there's uh, 600 million Muslims they say no she should wash so by the way still you have a choice to wash your vagina or not because as you see there's two opinion and the one he says most uh, correct opinion this is mean he agree with the uh, one of the opinion doesn't mean that he is because if we ask different imam he might say no the other opinion is the one is, is, uh, is alright uh, so all what we see all what we see in this story having sex with uh, uh, animals dead men uh, young old animals doesn't matter and the most important is that you must wash so uh, Islam is a very very high class intelligent religion you know study every case and uh, give the Muslims answers for their confusion and uh, Allah will never leave a Muslim or a Muslim man uh, confused about what he do what he should do in case he have uh, put his penis inside a woman anus or a man anus or an animal anus or vagina or its anus dead or alive uh, because Allah he wants your brother always to have the correct answer for every problem you have in your life and this is why Allah is great leave your comment under the video and as we say always Christ is Lord Islam is filthy see you soon greetings yet another reason to reject Islam the paradise Islam offers is full of carnal sexual sin may the Spirit of God open your eyes to the light your ears to the truth whoa that was over too quick what you mean it is not obvious? Okay, maybe I should slow down and back up. But before I do, this video is rated NC-17. I'm going to be blunt and honest and brutal about the evil, sinful crap Muhammad lusted for. You Mohammedans who blush at Ezekiel need to kiss mommy and daddy goodnight and go to bed. Have all the children left the room now? Reason number eight why I will forever reject Islam is the following. The paradise that Islam offers is a reprobate sexual fantasy. Do I need to establish for you the teaching of the 72 virgins promised to martyrs? Often imitated, never duplicated. Everyone on earth who has heard of Muhammad has heard of his offer to his martyrs. But let's establish a little firmer foundation here. Hazrat Ali narrated that the Apostle of Allah said, 
There is in paradise an open market wherein there will be no buying or selling, but will consist of men and women. When a man desires a beauty at once, he will have intercourse with them as desired. I don't know about you, but that makes my skin crawl. Did you Mohammedans know about Mohammed's promise of homosexual sex? Read it again, O Mohammedan. There is in paradise an open market. It will consist of men and women. When a man desires a beauty, at once he will have intercourse with them as desired. Mohammed says there are women and men to be had at this market in his hellish paradise. Mohammed does not say have sex with her, does he? He says with them. That includes both genders that this pagan reprobate fantasizes about having sex with. Really? Seriously? Okay, maybe that's one mistake by Mohammed. A fluke. A satanic verse. I mean, does it make any sense that a holy god would want to spend eternity as your party pimp? Think about it. Does the holy god of Abraham strike you as a repressed voyeur? Do you really think that for 4,000 years, God sent prophets condemning and forbidding sexual immorality only to be a sick, twisted bastard who offers it to you as the carrot to get you to kill yourself for him. You think he denies you sex on earth just to make you so uncontrollably hard up you'll do anything to get laid forever? Really? Seriously? I warned you I'd be blunt. Islam is an insult to Almighty God. No, 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 that is only the Hadiths. Only the Hadiths. Right. I always love that dodge. Let's look at the Quran then. Quran 52.17 As to the righteous, they will be in gardens and in happiness, enjoying the bliss which their Lord hath bestowed on them, and their Lord shall deliver them from the chastisement of the fire. So get the context here. The righteous, they go to the garden, delivered from the fire of hell. Ayat 19 To them will be said, Eat and drink ye with profit and health because of your good deeds. They will recline with ease upon couches arranged in ranks, and we shall wed them to maidens, the Arabic word is huris, with beautiful, big, and lustrous eyes. Didad is not here to explain it to you, but he would teach it this way. Huris, 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 huris. These huris are nothing but eternal whores. Sounds close enough to pass the Didad award for scholastic effort. And in fact, if you look up what a huri is, a super slut sexual slave is not inaccurate. A huri is a most beautiful young woman with a transparent body. The marrow of her bones is visible like the interior lines of pearls and rubies. She looks like red wine in a white glass. She is of white color and free from the routine physical disabilities of an ordinary woman such as menstruation, menopause, urinal and oval discharge, childbearing, and the related pollution. The Hori is a girl of tender age, having large breasts, which are round-pointed and, this is hilarious to me, not inclined to dangle. This is nothing more than the mind of a lustful man fantasizing about his sexual perversion. A female sex toy with no complications, no period, no children, no bodily functions, no responsibility. Really? Seriously? This is just another page out of a sci-fi fantasy porn novel. You Mohammedans are evil if you follow this crap. And God help you poor Mohammedan women, damned for eternity as sex slaves. Wait, uh, no, you are not the Huris, right? You are not young enough, and your breasts dangle. My bad, that makes it all better, right?
Quran 44 As to the righteous, they will be in a position of security, among gardens and springs, dressed in fine silk and in rich brocade. They will face each other. Righteous, gardens, silk. Got it? So, and we shall join them to companions, huris, with beautiful, big, and lustrous eyes. Still, the only things Allah will allow them to show in public through their paradise parkas, eternally covered in their bondage burkas. But that is only two examples from the Quran. And clearly I took that out of context, right? Right? This could be any garden sexual orgy with worries. Quran 55 In them will be bashful virgins, neither man nor jinn will have touched before, then which of the favors of the Lord will you deny? This doesn't make clear sense, the Quran being ambiguous and all. What does it mean to deny the favors of your Lord? Because it really comes across like Allah is buying your favor with his sexual super sluts. So I turned to the Musin Khan translation for clarification wherein both of those maidens, restraining their glances upon their husbands, whom no man or jinn has opened their hymens with sexual intercourse before them. Then which of the blessings of the Lord will you both, jinns and men, deny? Now, don't ask me what jinns are doing in paradise enjoying the huris. But Muhammad is stating women get raped by jinn as well in paradise. Read it again, O Muslima. Bashful virgins neither man nor jinn will have touched before. Why does Muhammad have to include genies in any of this anyway? Think about it. Think what a sick and twisted place this paradise Muhammad offers. I can go on. There are at least another dozen places where Muhammad documents his paradise of sexual orgies, with both women and men mentioned as sex slaves. And Islam calls Song of Solomon pornographic. But that hypocrisy and evil simply dodges the real problem. Islam's appeal is to man's sexual perversion. Islam does nothing to redeem man, nor can it. With 99 names, the Allah of Islam is still never called Redeemer. Chalk that up as more evidence Allah is not Yahweh. And that is why this is one more reason why I will forever reject Islam. There is no reason on earth you can use to excuse the perversion Muhammad is selling. And that is reason number eight, to reject Islam forever. And the interesting thing is, with eight documented reasons to reject Islam, I have not had even one Mohammedan able to address any of the reasons. I think that is because they are truly irrefutable and utterly damning of Islam. May the Spirit of God open your eyes to the light, your ears to the truth, and your heart to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May you want to be in the presence of Almighty God, the Holy God of Israel. Amen. America, one of the most important tasks for Muslim apologists here in the West is the desexualization of Islam. Islam allows sex with prepubescent girls, sex with up to four wives, sex with slave girls, sex with war captives. There was even a time when Islam allowed prostitution. It was called mutta. 
Sunnis believe that Muhammad eventually condemned the practice. Shias still believe Muta is okay. Muhammad had sex with at least nine wives on the same day. Yes, Muhammad was allowed to break the four-wife rule. After all, he was the one who was receiving the revelations. Nothing suspicious there. Muhammad had sex with his wife Aisha when she was nine years old. He had sex with his female captives and his slave girls. And Muhammad, according to Surah 33:21 of the Quran, is the example that all Muslims are supposed to imitate. Islam proclaims that Muslim men who enter paradise will be given at least 72 virgins. We hear a lot about the number 72, but according to uh, the Hadith, 72 virgins is the minimum. A really good Muslim will receive far more women in paradise. According to Ibn Kathir, the greatest Islamic commentator of all time, Muslims in paradise will be able to have sex with 100 virgins a day. And in case Muslims are worried that they won't have the strength for that much sex, Muhammad promised that Allah will give them miraculous sexual abilities, including eternal erections. Now in the West, Muslims want to portray Islam as the pure, holy, uncorrupted worship of Allah. Islam is about modesty and self-control and decency. But when we open the Muslim sources and find a far greater emphasis on sex than we find in America or in any of the cultures Muslims routinely condemn, we start getting suspicious, we start asking questions, and when people start questioning and criticizing Islam, what do you do? You reinterpret your scriptures to make your religion more palatable to your audience. And this is the standard practice for many Muslims in the West. What's disturbing is that some of the top American television networks are now totally on board with the project. They're actually helping Muslims water down Muhammad's teachings in order to make Islam more attractive to Westerners. ABC News, you'll remember, went so far as to promote the radical group Revolution Muslim as America's first line of defense against radicalism. ABC has dedicated some of their best reporters to the task of painting a rosy picture of Islam. So, ABC, let's focus on just one of the questions you answered for us in your 2020 special. What about all those virgins in paradise? That's a concern to some of us in the West. Do you think you could get someone to reinterpret Muhammad's teachings for us? Is there anything in the Quran that promises 72 virgins for a, for a holy martyr? I don't see any evidence in the Quran for the pledge of 72 virgins. This notion of 72 virgins actually comes from a mistranslation, uh, with the real translation being 72 raisins and other more modern books distort the scripture even more. 72 raisins? 72 raisins. 72 raisins? 72 raisins. Raisins? 72 raisins. These things? 72 raisins. Why not just go to the grocery store? 72 raisins. You see, all those terrorists and suicide bombers shouldn't have listened to their shakes they should have gone to ABC News for the correct interpretation of the Quran. Then they would have realized that Islam only promises raisins, not virgins, in paradise. And let's face it, who's going to blow himself up for a box of raisins? Ursad Maji claims that the term horis should be translated as raisins. Now, just to make this easy for Miss Manji, I'm going to throw out all of the hadith, all of the Sarah literature, all of the commentaries, and all of their clear descriptions of sex with Horis. That's where we get the real details about Muhammad's paradise. But let's just go with the Quran on this one. What does the Quran say about the Horis Muslims will receive in paradise? Surah 44, 51 through 54. As for the righteous, they shall be lodged in peace together amid gardens and fountains, arrayed in rich silks and fine brocade, even thus, and we shall wed them to dark-eyed Horis. So, Muslims are going to marry these Horis. Surah 52, 20. They will recline with ease on thrones arranged in ranks, and we shall marry them to Horis, female fair ones, with wide lovely eyes. Again, Muslims are going to marry their Horis. Surah 55, 54 through 56, 
They shall recline on couches lined with thick brocade, and within reach will hang the fruits of both gardens. Which of your Lord's blessings would you deny? Therein are bashful virgins, whom neither man nor genie will have touched before. Bashful virgins never touched by man or by genies. Surah 55, 70-74 In each of the gardens there shall be virgins chaste and fair. Which of your Lord's blessings would you deny? Dark-eyed virgins, sheltered in their tents, which of your Lord's blessings would you deny, whom neither man nor genie will have touched before? These virgins are going to be chaste. Surah 56, 22-24 And there will be companions with beautiful, big, and lustrous eyes, like unto pearls well guarded, a reward for the deeds of their past life. These Horis will have beautiful, lustrous eyes. Surah 56, 35-38 Verily we have created them, maidens, of special creation, and made them virgins, loving their husbands only, equal in age, for those on the right hand. The Horis will be very loving. Surah 78, 31-34 Surely, for the God-fearing, awaits a place of security, gardens and vineyards and maidens with swelling breasts, like of age and a cup overflowing. The Horis will have swelling breasts. Let's put all of this together. According to ABC News, Muslims in paradise will get married to beautiful-eyed, large-breasted, chaste, loving raisins that have never been touched by man or jinn. That's your story, ABC? If I were a Muslim, I think I would actually be upset at this distortion. Go ahead and try to insert the word raisins into some of the verses we looked at. And we shall marry them to... Raisins. ...with wide, lovely eyes. Surely, for the God-fearing awaits a place of security, gardens and vineyards and raisins with swelling breasts. Is ABC News accusing Muslims of being attracted to raisins? Oh, the Islamophobia being attracted to raisins would be much, much weirder than being attracted to virgins. It's grapeophilia. Do you like dried fruit? Convert to Islam. You'll get to marry some large-breasted raisins. ABC did this over and over again in their special about Islam. They would raise a question, an important question, like why is there such an emphasis in Islam on deflowering virgins in paradise? And then they give an answer that can't possibly be correct. All you have to do is open up the Quran and you'll see that the Quran can't possibly be referring to raisins. And then after misleading millions of Americans, ABC would move on to the next topic. When did it become the job of American television networks to deceive Americans, to water down the facts, and to help propagate Islam? I don't know. But the sooner people realize what's going on, the sooner we can start demanding accurate answers to our questions. Stay tuned, America. We've got a lot more to cover.
Islam promotes dangerous, we might even say deadly, hygiene practices. And I, I'm willing to lay this down as a rule. If your religion would get you killed because of its hygiene practices, if you took it seriously, um, probably not the true religion, probably not from God. What do I mean here? Um, well, there are lots of directions we could go. For instance, I could point out that uh, according to Surah 4, verse 3, Muslims can marry up to four women. And that according to Surah 4, verse 24, and other, Mus and other passages in the Quran, uh, Muslims can have many sex slaves, captives that they capture in battle. So you go into battle, uh, you capture a woman, you take her home and you have sex with her, she's your captive, and then you go have sex with your four wives, right? You don't know what kind of diseases that woman has, right? You, 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 just, you just captured her in battle. You don't know if she's got syphilis or AIDS or what. You don't know what she's got. And you're going right. from her back to your four wives who are producing your children. You are spreading disease yeah. like wildfire. Uh, but we won't go in that direction. Let's just go with what we would normally think of when we, when, when we talk about hygiene. Sunan Abu Dawood, number 67. I heard that the people asked the Prophet of Allah, Water is brought for you from the well of Buddha. It is a well in which dead dogs, menstrual cloths, and excrement of people are thrown. The Messenger of Allah replied, Verily, water is pure and is not defiled by anything. Hmm. Notice what this says. Yeah. Water's brought to you. <laughs> We're bringing this to you and your people, Muhammad. Oh, wow. huh? That's nasty. And there's just one problem, the, wa the well where we're getting this, this is our garbage. Ooh. This is where we throw our garbage. This is where we throw our dead animals. This is where we throw used menstrual cloths. And this is where we dump our toilet buckets into. Oh, yeah. And we're scooping up some water to bring it to you so you can wash up and perform your ablutions. Any problem with that, prophet of God? <laughs> no, water's not made impure by anything. Nothing you can do will make water impure. If you t fortunately, most Muslims do not take that seriously, right? Praise fortunately, God. if you as a Muslim took this seriously, you are dead. You will die. Fortunately, again, for fortunately, most Muslims know better than their prophet, right? Muhammad didn't know. I'm surprised. Uh, I'm yeah, surprised he, wow. he made it through life. Um, but notice, uh, go ahead and wash up with uh, your, you know, dead animal and menstrual cloth. Uh, and well, even dogs, water. right? They're dogs. No. Oh, my goodness. They carry parasites, my goodness. But it's not just for washing up. Sunan ibn Majah, number 520. It was narrated that Jabir ibn Abdullah said, We came to a pond in which there was the carcass of a donkey. So we refrained from using the water until the Messenger of Allah came. Notice, we refrained from using the water. Smart. Yep. Smart. Maybe it. we shouldn't drink this water with the dead donkey floating in it. Ooh. We refrained from using the water until the Messenger of Allah came to us and said, Water is not made pure by anything, made impure by anything. It's his rule, right? You can't do anything to make what you put dead animals in it, use menstrual cloths, garbage, uh, you can urinate in it, you can use a bat, it doesn't matter. Uh, water is not made impure by anything. So what did they do? What did the Muslims do? Then we drank from it and gave it to our animals to drink and we carried some with us. So we took, put some in our little canteens, we uh, drank some of it, we gave some of it to our animals. Dead donkey floating in it. And uh, if you don't know the importance of that, there, that's bad, ladies and gentlemen. We'll just say that it's bad to be drinking water with dead animals floating in it. Uh, let's read a couple more. Sahih al-Bukhari, number 5782. Allah's messenger said, if a fly falls into the vessel of any of you, let him dip all of it into the vessel and then throw it, i.e. the fly, away. For in one of its wings there's a disease and in the other there is healing, the antidote, uh, the treatment for that disease. So notice what he says, right? You're sitting there, you're, you're, you're eating something, you're drinking something, fly lands in your food. Um, you know, you could just throw the fly away or scoop it out or something like this. Um, no, says Muhammad, you dunk that fly all the way in the food. You keep pushing the fly in the food. Why? Because even though one of the fly's wings has a disease on it, the other wing has the cure for the disease. This is your prophet. You have to believe it, right? So according to your prophet, um, if there's a disease that's carried by flies, just go to the other, just go to yeah. the other wing. First of all, it's, it's, it's only on one wing, but the other wing has, has, has the cure, cure right? Yeah. Yeah. So flies carry all kinds of uh, diseases, let's say typhoid, right? Uh, flies, 
they eat some very nasty stuff, right? If an animal goes to the bathroom on the ground, flies go to that, right? And that's what they crawl around on. And then that fly, that same fly, goes uh, away from the excrement of that possibly sick Ooh. animal and goes into your food. And what do you do? Get rid of it? Throw it out? No! Dunk that fly in the food. Uh -huh. Then you get rid of the fly. Then you eat your food because you've got the cure now, right? Now you've got the cure. Boy, you made me lose my appetite, man. I don't think I'm going to eat for a week. I mean, probably I need to. <laughs> One more. Uh, Musnid Ahmed, number 16, 245. Muawiyah said, I saw the prophet sucking on the tongue or the lips of Al-Hassan, son of Ali. May the prayers of Allah be upon him. For no tongue or lips that the prophet sucked on will be tormented by hellfire. So, uh, Muhammad, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, just to clarify, I'm not insinuating that there's anything homosexual involved here. It's just some weird practice that Muhammad had where he would suck on the tongue of other boys and men, right? right. And in this case, it would be his grandson here. Son of so, hey, grandson, come here, I want to suck on your tongue. Um, you suck on my tongue. Now, uh, I'm only talking about the, the, the hygiene practice here because think about this, right? We want to wash up for dinner, right, Sam? We're going to have a good meal. Yeah. So we go and we get some water from a well with uh, human waste and dead dogs and used menstrual cloths in it. We put our hands in there. We wash up for dinner, right? We perform our, 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 our ablutions for our meal. We're going to wash up. We go sit down. We got him up. Oh, a fly who just flew off a pile of dog waste. Uh, then lands in my food, I start dunking that, and now that I've dunked it in there, I know I've got all the cure off of there, so now I can eat my food, but now I'm feeling sick, right? Because I have, uh, you know, dead dog germs all over my hand and menstrual cloth waste all over my hands and, uh, and feces and urine all over my hands because that was, that's what was in the well. I washed up with that, now I'm eating the food and I dunked the fly, and it's got the disease on it, I'm eating that. Now I've got, it, now I've got a stomach ache, Sam. So I want to refresh myself with a glass of, glass of water. So I get a glass of dead donkey water. They got the donkey floating in it. I take a drink of that. Now I'm feeling really bad. Call the kid over here, suck on his tongue, pass all the germs to him. And now what's the, what's the solution? We're all feeling real bad. What's the solution, Sam? Camel urine. We'll just go drink a bunch of camel urine because, uh, because that's how you, that's yeah, how you mix you're. it in with milk. Camel urine and milk, that's how you get rid of uh, your stomach ills. Ladies and gentlemen, is this guy a prophet? I'm just asking, is this guy a prophet? Because every one of you out there, you know you would never follow these practices. You know that if you did follow these practices, you would die. And so you know what? You know that you know this is not coming from God. These people are coming to Muhammad. Muhammad, guide us. Can we do this? Yes, water is not made impure by anything. He's speaking as a prophet there. And he's wrong. And if you believe him, you will die. These, this is not a joke here, ladies and gentlemen. If you follow Muhammad, you can die from this. Definitely, yeah. So deep down, if you're not following this, deep down, do you really believe in your prophet? Oh boy. I'm not sure they do, my friend. Yeah.
Chapter 13 The Pedophile Pirate When the prophet married Asia, she was very young and not yet ready for consummation. Chairman Mohammed settled into his public housing project and immediately began to act like the fool he had become. Ishak, in the year of the prophet's arrival, Abba Uama died from a rattling in the throat. The messenger said, His death is an evil thing for the Jews and the Arab hypocrites, for they are sure to say if Muhammad were really a prophet, his companion would not have died. But truly I have no power with Allah, either for myself or for my companions. Truer words were never spoken. Muhammad had no morals either. Tabari. The prophet married Asia in Mecca three years before the Hijra, after the death of Khadija. At the time, she was six. Ishak. When the apostle came to Medina, he was fifty-three. Tabari. In May 623 A.D., or A.H. 1, Allah's messenger consummated his marriage to Asia. He would be dead in ten years. She hadn't even lived that long. Pedophilia was, and continues to be, child abuse. The abused had come full circle. He was now an abuser. Accusing a prophet of being a pedophile sounds outrageous, yet the evidence is undeniable. Tabari. When the prophet married Asia, she was very young and not yet ready for consummation. This is how it all happened. Tabari. My mother came to me while I was being swung on a swing between two branches and got me down. My nurse took over and wiped my face with some water and started leading me. When I was at the door, she stopped so I could catch my breath. I was brought in while Muhammad was sitting on a bed in our house. My mother made me sit on his lap. The other men and women got up and left. The prophet consummated his marriage with me in my house when I was nine years old. Given a choice, I believe most people would prefer to get their spiritual inspiration from someone who isn't a sexual predator. Muhammad struggled to justify this behavior. Bukhari the prophet said, A virgin should not be married till she is asked for her consent. O oh, apostle, how will the virgin express her consent? He said, By remaining silent. Allah's apostle told Asia, You were shown to me twice in my dreams, also known as sexual fantasies. I beheld a man or angel carrying you in a silken cloth. He said to me, She is yours, so uncover her. And behold, it was you. I would then say to myself, If this is from Allah, then it must happen. Allah not only approved pedophilia, He insisted upon it. That makes the Islamic God as perverted as His prophet. Since 53-year-old pedophiles are not prophet material, I want to give Islam every opportunity to clear this up. The next hadith is from Asia. Tabari there are special features in me that have not been in any woman except for what Allah bestowed on Miriam bit Imran. She was referring to Mary, the mother of Yeshua, although she didn't know her name or her father's name, and none of the features actually applied. Amram is actually the father of Moses, with Miriam, or Mary, being Moses' sister. Muhammad got confused and erroneously attributed Moses' father to Miriam, the mother of Yeshua. I do not say this to exalt myself over any of my companions. What are these? someone asked. Asia replied, The angel brought down my likeness. She was a babe. The messenger married me when I was seven. My marriage was consummated when I was nine. She was abused. He married me when I was a virgin, no other man having shared me with him. She was a child. Inspiration came to him when he and I were in a single blanket. A baby inspired him. I was one of the dearest people to him. A verse of the Quran was revealed concerning me when the community was almost destroyed. She inspired Allah. And I saw Gabriel when none of his other wives saw him. She lied. Think about the implications of what Asia just said. 
Muhammad was inspired. A Quran surah was handed down while the Prophet was having sex with a little girl. Allah didn't find pedophilia the least bit troubling. The following confirms that the first Muslims were consumed by greed. The Prophet was inspired by the body of a child, and the circumstances surrounding the Quran revelations are as perverted as the scriptures themselves. Bukhari The people used to send presents to the Prophet on the day of Aisha's turn to have sex with him. Aisha said his other wives gathered in the apartment of Umm Salama, wife number two, and said, Umm, the people send presents on the day of Aisha's turn, and we too love the good presents just as much as she does. You should tell Allah's apostle to order the people to send their presents to him, regardless of whose turn it may be. Umm repeated that to the Prophet, and he turned away from her. When the Prophet returned to Um, she repeated the request again. The Prophet again turned away. After the third time, the Prophet said, Um, don't trouble me by harming Asia, for by Allah, the divine inspiration, that would be Quran surahs, never came to me while I was under the blanket of any woman among you except her. If there have been any skeptics who have made it this far without acknowledging that the Quran was inspired to satisfy Muhammad's cravings rather than to save men's souls, welcome to the realm of reason. Earlier I accused the victim of pedophilia of lying. I want to explain why. Her eighth divine gift was contradicted during one of the bedroom revelations. Bukhari The Prophet said, Asia, this is Gabriel. He sends his greetings and salutations. Aisha said salutations and greetings to him and Allah's blessings. Addressing the Prophet, she said, You see what I don't see. This hadith reveals how perverted Muhammad was and how sane other Arabs were by contrast. Bukhari I participated in a ghazwa, which would be an Islamic raid, with the Prophet. I said, Apostle, I am a bridegroom. He asked me whether I had married a virgin or a matron. I answered, a matron. He said, why not a virgin who would have played with you? Then you could have played with her. Apostle, my father was martyred, and I have some young sisters. So I felt it not proper that I should marry a young girl as young as them. It's obvious who corrupted whom. Muhammad's behavior would be considered criminal in every civilized nation on earth. No moral society has ever condoned old men having sex with young children. If you are caught, you're locked up, separated from decent people. Pedophilia is so heinous, convicted felons torment child abusers. Even they can't stand to be in their presence. Such a grotesque act disqualified Mohammed from his alleged calling. What's more, his personal perversity had a lasting legacy. Muslims follow his example. While most of what happens in the Islamic world escapes our purview, as Islam is hostile to all freedoms, including press and inquiry, we have gained glimpses in Afghanistan and Iraq. There, virginal young girls are frequently raped by Muslim men. And as you would expect in a culture influenced by Muhammad, the victims are shamed, not the perpetrators. It's little wonder Muhammad's contemporaries call him mad, insane, and demon-possessed. It is little wonder Islamic clerics try so hard to hide this stuff from the world. It is why Muhammad assassinated a score of poets, the journalists of their day, who had the courage to expose him. It is why Muslim rulers issue fatwas today. Decadent egomaniacs like Muhammad are deeply troubled and tortured souls. Their insecurities drive unbridled lusts for power, sex, and money. Their feelings of inadequacy cause them to be shy, yet their outward manner overcompensates, making them abusive and purposefully deceptive. They need others to bow down to them in submission, and they require unquestioned obedience. Mohammed was a textbook case, as was Adolf Hitler, his modern twin. Bukhari the prophet was shyer than a veined virgin girl. Allah's apostle said, Whoever obeys me obeys Allah, and whoever disobeys me disobeys Allah, and whoever obeys the ruler I appoint obeys me, and whoever disobeys him disobeys me. 
pedophilia, incest, and rape are all perverted manifestations of a thirst for power and control. Insecurity is often the cause. I apologize for dragging you through this muck. I realize the material we just covered would be illegal, even in a pornographic movie. And we are not done. We have yet to deal with the prophet's other depravities, incest and rape. But at least you know why this control freak's paradise was a brothel filled with ever-attentive young virgins ready to be conquered. Muhammad, like his religion, was fixated on the flesh. According to the Quran, bodies were reassembled so that the skins could be singed in hell and teased in paradise. Man's spirit was incidental. I believe this is because the religion was made in the Prophet's image. It reflected his character and desires. To appreciate Islam's elevation of body over soul, we must look at the source of his inspiration. Muhammad was right when he described the angel that visited him as a slave. Bukhari So Allah conveyed the inspiration to his slave, Gabriel, and then he, Gabriel, conveyed it to Muhammad. Angels, fallen or heavenly, demonic or godly, have no choice. To borrow another line from Islam, they must submit and obey. Islam's dark spirit knew all about angelic submission, because he once was one. Quran 7, verse 11. It is we who created you and gave you shape. Then we ordered the angels to fall and prostrate themselves to Adam. The same passage goes on to correctly implicate Satan and suggest angels are eternal. Quran 7, verse 19. Satan said, Your Lord only forbid you this tree, lest you should become angels, immortal, living forever. Satan, like all angels, is a four-dimensional construct. That is to say, he can maneuver in time, the fourth dimension. While this may sound complex, we have known since Einstein that space has a fourth axis, an infinite aspect we cannot yet navigate. In this regard, angels are superior to men as we are trapped in three-dimensional bodies, stuck in time. Yahweh is not, which is why his name means I am or I exist. He is immortal and timeless. His infinity exists in the fourth dimension. This is how Yahweh predicts the future. He knows the future not because he has ordained it, but because he has already been there and witnessed the culmination of our choices. Now put yourself in Satan's wings for a moment. He knows that his spirit is inferior to ours for two reasons. We are made spiritually in God's image. We have choice. With choice, we have the capacity to be creative and to love. This is why God created us. These attributes remain his and our most powerful qualities. So Satan doesn't want to compete with us spiritually. There he cannot win. But when he competes bodily, he cannot lose. We are three-dimensional, he is four. The difference is infinite, just as it is between the two and three-axis realms. The comparison is like a cartoon rendering of Mickey Mouse competing with Walt Disney, or more accurately, with Walt's secretary. This is why Islam is focused on the body. It's why the covetous Muhammad was the perfect satanic prophet. The arrival of the first child born to the Muslims after the Hijra was celebrated. Tabari. The messenger's companions cried, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater or greatest, therefore greater than Yahweh is the implication. When she was born, this was because the story was circulated among the Muslims that the Jews claimed that they had bewitched them so that no children would be born. The Muslims praised Allah that he had falsified the Jews' claim. They were saying that their gods' magic spells were more powerful than the Jewish gods. Even if they were right, it made Islam wrong. The next seven section heads in Tabati's The Foundation of the Community begin with Expedition. The Arabic word is Magazi, which is translated Raid in the Sirah. 
It actually means invasion. It is synonymous with jihad, defined by Bukhari as holy fighting in Allah's cause. A more complete explanation is provided in the Book of Jihad on page 580 of Maktaba Dar as Salam's publication of Sahih al Bukhari. Jihad is holy fighting in Allah's cause with full force and weaponry. It is given the utmost importance in Islam and is one of its pillars. By jihad, Islam is established. Allah is made superior and He becomes the only God who may be worshipped. By jihad, Islam is propagated and made superior. By abandoning jihad, may Allah protect us from that. Islam is destroyed and Muslims fall into an inferior position. Their honor is lost, their lands are stolen, and Muslim rule and authority vanish. Jihad is an obligatory duty in Islam on every Muslim. He who tries to escape this duty dies as a hypocrite. Memorize this paragraph. Shout it out to all who will listen. Every word was derived from the Quran. Every word was lived by Muhammad. It accurately represents fundamental Islam. So much so, each of the 150 hadiths that follow this definition of jihad speak of fighting. None suggest a spiritual struggle. Among them, Muhammad says that the most important deed is jihad, fighting in Allah's cause. In Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52, Number 44, and the Quran agrees, saying peaceful Muslims are hypocrites. Destined for hell, they are the worst of creatures, the most vile of animals. You will find this in Quran Surahs three and thirty-three. So that there is no question regarding the appropriateness of using Bukhari as a source, here's what the Islamic scholars had to say in the preface. Al Bukhari's hadith is the most authentic and true book of the Prophet. The translator said, "I am perfectly sure that the translation." With Allah's help and after all the great efforts exerted in its production, has neared perfection. The Imams from the Cradle of Islam, the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia, said, "It has been unanimously agreed that Imam Bukhari's work is the most authentic of all the other sources in Hadith literature put together. It is second only to the Quran." That leaves you and me at the crossroads of destiny. If we don't deal with the awesome gravity of Islamic jihad, our future will vanish before our eyes. If we wish to avoid the abyss of world war, we must expose the doctrine committed to world conquest. We must liberate Muslims from Islam. The expedition led by Hamza was the first Maghazi. Hamza, a huntsman in Mecca, was now a muhajid, plural of mujahideen. A Muslim warrior in jihad, Tabari. In Ramadan, seven months after the Hijra, Muhammad entrusted a white war banner to Hamza with the command of thirty immigrants. Their aim was to intercept a Quraysh caravan. Seven months after fleeing Mecca in shame, the pedophile prophet has become a pirate and terrorist. So that there is no misunderstanding, let's define these less than admirable characterizations. Pirate is a renegade who, along with others under his command, uses force of arms to steal the property of others. A terrorist is a person who violently attacks civilians, destroys their property, and disrupts their economy as a means to achieve a political objective. The flag Muhammad handed to Hamza was a war banner. It was one of the many symbols the Prophet stole from his patriarch Kusay. Hamza was a warrior. He was given command over thirty men. Their aim was to intercept a caravan, a civilian economic enterprise owned by the people Muhammad had promised to slaughter because they had teased him. Although we are told they separated without a battle, the intent was piracy and terror. Their failure did not change what they had become, what Islam had done to them. At this point in the Prophet's career, there were simply more good guys than there were bad guys, and he was as inept as a pirate as he was as a prophet. Turning to Muhammad's biographer, we learn more about the mindset of the first Muslims. Ishak, 
Hamza's expedition to the seashore comprised 30 riders, all emigrants from Mecca. He met Abu Jal, who had 300 riders. Amar intervened, for he was at peace with both sides. Hamza, Muhammad's raider, said, So they allege, wonder at good sense and at folly, and at lack of sound counsel and sensible advice. Their people and property are not yet violated, as we haven't attacked. We call them to Islam, which is surrender. But they treat it as a joke. They laughed until I threatened them. At the apostle's command, I was the first to march beneath his flag, a victorious banner from Allah. Even as they sullied forth, burning with rage, Allah frustrated their schemes. Abu Jal, a pagan businessman, responded to the first Muslim militants. Ishaq, I am amazed at the causes of anger and folly at those who stir up strife by lying controversy. They abandon our father's ways. They come with lies to twist our mind. But even their lies cannot confound the wise. If you give up your raids, we will take you back, for you are our cousins, our kin. But they chose to believe Muhammad and became obstinately contentious. All their deeds became evil. As always, the Meccans understood Islam. Even Ishak believed. Ishak, the raid on Wadan was the first Maghazi. He said, The expedition of Ubaidah Harith was second. The apostle sent Ubaidah out on a raid with sixty or eighty riders from the immigrants, there not being a single Ansar among them. He encountered a large number of Quraysh in the Hijaz. Abu Bakr composed a poem about the raid. Some of the most memorable lines include, When we called them to the truth, they turned their backs and howled like bitches. Allah's punishment on them will not tarry. I swear by the Lord of Camels, I assume he's speaking of Allah, that I am no perjurer. A valiant band will descend upon the Quraysh, which will leave women husbandless. It will leave men dead with vultures wheeling round. It will not spare the infidels. To which a pagan named Slave to Allah replied, Ishak, does your eye weep unceasingly over the ruins of a dwelling? This would be Allah's house. That the shifting sands obscure? Is your army and declaration of war firm enough that we should abandon images venerated in Mecca, passed on to heirs by a noble ancestor? That noble ancestor was Kusay. Are your steeds panting at the fray? Are your swords polished white? Are they in the hands of warriors, dangerous as lions? Or are you conceited? Are you here to quench your thirst for vengeance? Nay, they withdraw in great fear and awe. Of the raid, the historian reports, Tabadi, eight months after the Hijra, Allah's messenger entrusted a white war banner to Ubaida and ordered him to march to Batan Rabig. He reached the pass of Mara near Jufha at the head of sixty emigrants without a single Ansari, or Medina Muslim, among them. They met the polytheists at a watering place called Aya. They shot arrows at one another, but there was no hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The prophet is now a repeat offender. Eight months into the Islamic era, and he has ordered multiple attacks. Muslim apologists profess that Muhammad was forced into defending Islam, and that he was neither aggressor, pirate, nor terrorist. But that position is indefensible. Nothing is known about the Muhammad of history. No independent records exist. All that is known about him is contained in these hadith. If they say he attacked a civilian caravan and then ordered men to march and fight in another town, he did. Therefore, he was the aggressor. There isn't even a hint of self-defense in these traditions, nor do they try to explain away the prophet's motives. They were after money, not armies, booty, not converts. You may be wondering why none of the Ansari joined the Muslim immigrants from Mecca on either of these raids. I believe the answer is that they hadn't been Muslims long enough, and therefore they still knew right from wrong. Islam had already corrupted the Meccan Muslims to the point that they thought piracy and terror were justifiable, even admirable. Kind of reminds us of modern-day Islamic terrorists. 
Ishak. Then the apostle went raiding in the month of Rabi ul Awal, making for the Quraysh. He turned to Medina without fighting. Then he raided the Quraysh by way of Dinar. Tabari. In this year, the messenger entrusted to Saad a white war banner for the expedition of Karar. Saad said, I set out on foot at the head of twenty men. We used to lie hidden by day and march at night, until we reached Karar on the fifth morning. The caravan had arrived in town a day before. There were sixty men with it. Those who were with Saad were all emigrants. Mohammed is now a serial offender, a committed pirate and terrorist, albeit a failed one. Tabari The messenger of Allah went out on a raid as far as Wadan, searching for the Quraysh, in the course of which the Banu Damra made a treaty of friendship with him. Then Muhammad returned to Mecca without any fighting and remained there for the rest of the month. This time Muhammad took command himself, with the express intent of finding the Quraysh and robbing them. And while it is noble that he inked a treaty of friendship, even this was the wrong thing for a prophet to do. Treaties are political, not religious. Muhammad was now considered a fellow chief, commanding a band of armed men, hardly prophet-like. And besides, the Quran would ultimately say that treaties with unbelieving infidels weren't binding on Muslims. This alliance was with pagans. Tabari. During this day, he sent Ubaida at the head of sixty horsemen from the immigrants without a single Ansari among them. He got as far as the watering place in Hijaz, which is central Arabia, below the pass of Mara. There he met a band of Quraysh, but there was no fighting except Saad shot an arrow. Then the two groups separated from one another, the Muslims leaving a rear guard. Islamic raiders marched with the intent to plunder and kill. The only thing that stopped them from achieving their objective was the sight of a superior force. As we seek to defend ourselves today, we would do well to keep this in mind. Tabari Muhammad led an expedition in the month of Rabi al-Akhir in search of the Quraysh. He went as far as Buat in the region of Radwa, and then returned without any fighting. Then he led another expedition in search of the Meccans. He took the mountain track and crossed the desert, halting beneath a tree in Matha. He prayed there. What on earth was he praying for? Oh, God, please help me rob and kill these people. Thank you. Amen. After a few days, the prophet went out in pursuit of the Quds. The Islamic era was but a year old, yet Muslims were fully committed to the path of piracy and terror. Forget for a moment that this was supposed to be a religion. There was nothing noble, moral, or redeeming about raiding parties seeking to plunder civilian caravans or expeditions marching off to terrorize unsuspecting villagers. Just as there was no redeeming surah in Mecca, there is no virtuous behavior in Medina. I haven't cherry-picked the ugly parts out of a sea of religious activities. I have reported everything. The second year of the Islamic era began as the first one ended. The opening headline reads, Tabari, Expeditions Led by Allah's Messenger. This was followed by, In this year, according to all Sira writers, the messenger personally led the Ghazwa of Alwa. A Ghazwa is an Islamic invasion in Allah's cause, consisting of a large army unit led by the Prophet himself. He left Saad in command of Medina. On this raid, his banner was carried by Hamza. He stayed out for fifteen days and then returned to Medina. This was the eighth failed terrorist attack in as many months. There are two interesting subtleties here. First, Saad, Chairman Mohammed's most fierce warrior, was left in command of Medina because the Prophet had become a warlord. And considering the nature of the Islamic world today, that made him a role model. Second, the religion of Islam actually coined a word to define an armed raid personally led by its prophet. There's something very perverse about that. According to Wikidi, the messenger went out on a Ghazwa raid at the head of 200 of his companions in October 623 and reached Buat. His intention was to intercept a Quraysh caravan with a hundred men and twenty-five hundred camels. 
This expedition was neither a military operation, nor was it defensive, and it most assuredly wasn't religious. It was an act of terrorism against a civilian economic activity, and the pirate was after booty. The Hadith reports, In this year, Muhammad set forth the emigrants to intercept a Quraysh caravan en route to Syria. His war banner was carried by Hamza. It also failed. The score was Muslim militants zero, infidels ten. Unfortunately, Islam would get far better at this game than they ever got at religion. Ishak and Tabari Ali and I were with the messenger on the Ghazwa at Ushera. We halted on one occasion and saw some men of the Banu Mudi working in one of their date groves. I said, why don't we go and see how they work? So we went and watched them for a while. Then we felt drowsy and went to sleep on the dusty ground under the trees. Muhammad woke us, arriving as we were covered in dust. He stirred Ali with his foot and said, Arise, O dusty one! Shall I tell you who was the most wretched man? Amar of Thamud, for he slaughtered the she-camel, and he shall strike you here. Muhammad put his hand on the side of Ali's head until he was soaked from it. Then he grabbed his beard. The Quran claims that the Thamudic nation was destroyed by Allah because someone hamstrung a camel. While it's odd that he liked camels more than men, there's a bigger perversion still in this tale of misplaced ambition. The Muslims were so unfamiliar with honest labor, they went to watch someone work. And they were so lazy, they fell asleep while they were doing it. Ultimately, that is why the pirates were there in the first place. When the bedraggled Muslim refugees migrated north, they became dependent upon handouts. They were physically able to do work, since they went off on terrorist raids, and the oasis town of Yathrib was a bustling agricultural and commercial center, so there was plenty of work being done. All of which leads to a conclusion. Something in Islam made the Muslims unwilling to work, and it affects them to this day. Islamic states have the lowest per capita productivity of any nations in the world. Islam politically and economically is as faulty as the religion is false. It's lose-lose. Ishak. Meanwhile, the apostle sent Saad on the raid of Abu Waqqas. The prophet only stayed a few nights in Medina before raiding Ushera and then Kurs. Let's review Bukhari's book of Makazi to get a better feel for what's happening. Bukhari. Allah's apostle said, A time will come when a group of Muslims will wage holy war, and it will be said, Is there anyone who has accompanied Allah's apostle? They will say, Yes. And so victory will be bestowed upon them. The apostle said, Tomorrow I will give the flag to a man whose leadership Allah will use to grant a Muslim victory. I fought in seven Ghazwat battles along with the Prophet, and fought in nine Maghazi raids in armies dispatched by the Prophet. There was nothing spiritual about fundamental Islam. Bukhari. I heard Saad saying, I was the first Arab to shoot an arrow in Allah's cause. I witnessed a scene that was dearer to me than anything I had ever seen. Aswad came to the Prophet while Muhammad was urging Muslims to fight the pagans. He said, We shall fight on your right and on your left, and in front of you and behind you. I saw the face of the Prophet getting bright with happiness, for that saying delighted him. Bukhari The believers who did not join in the Ghazwa and those who fought are not equal in reward. Allah's Apostle said, When your enemy comes near, shoot at them, but use your arrow sparingly, so that they are not wasted. Allah's wrath became severe on anyone the Prophet killed in Allah's cause. While the terrorist raids were hardly religious, religious symbolism and rewards were used to solicit and inspire the new combatants. Bukhari Muhammad led the fear prayer with one batch of his army, while the other batch faced the enemy. Bukhari. The prophet said, This is Gabriel holding the head of his horse, equipped with arms for battle. 
Allah's apostle used to say, None has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, because He has honored His warriors and made His messengers victorious. He alone defeated the infidel clans, so there is nothing left. Bukhari, a man came to the prophet and said, Can you tell me where I will go if I get martyred? The prophet replied, To paradise. The man fought till he was martyred. There are no such bargains in Yahweh's scriptures. Killing is not an express ticket to heaven. Yeshua never asked his followers to slay anyone. The Messiah mentions killing only once. He tells a parable about a ruler in the final days of the tribulation to encourage his followers to be productive, not destructive. Allah especially hated Christians and Jews, ordering Muslims to fight them until they were wiped out to the last. This is fundamental Islam, the very core of Muhammad's message. That said, there is one Bible verse that appears to be both open-ended and to encourage violence. As such, Psalm 149 became the rallying cry for the Crusades. In actuality, it's prophetic, speaking of what's called the Tribulation and of the return of the Messiah. In the fashion of Hebrew poetry, the psalm presents a series of nine couplets, pairs of phrases that say the same thing, but in different words. Let's review them. The first couplet speaks prophetically of the new millennium, of the church and of saints. Praise Yahweh, sing unto Yahweh a fresh song, and sing His praise in the congregation of saints. The second celebrates the end of the tribulation and the Messiah's return. Let Israel rejoice in Yahweh who made them. Let the children of Israel be joyful in their king. Then, let them praise Yahweh's character and dance. Let them sing praises unto Yahweh with the tambourine and harp. Speaking of the Messiah's gift of salvation, the next reports, For Yahweh is pleased with His people. He will glorify the meek with salvation. The fifth couplet reveals, let the saints be joyful in this glorious honor. Let them shout from their resting place. At the Messiah's return, the souls of the saints will be raised from their graves. A Catholic pope misinterpreted the sixth verse to advance his personal agenda. Let the exaltation of the Almighty be in their mouths, and a two-edged sword be in their open hand. A two-edged sword is the Bible's metaphor for divine judgment, or for rendering a godly verdict. That's why it's in an open hand, which could not wield an instrument of violence. Its pair in the couplet references the exalted words of the Almighty, suggesting an oral verdict, not a slashing weapon. The seventh pair proclaims, to advance vengeance upon the nations, and punishment upon the people. This speaks to the final judgment of Yahweh, on those who attack Israel during World War III, midway through the tribulation. It's interesting in that the predicted Magog war against Israel is perpetrated entirely by Muslims. This is followed by, to yoke kings together, bringing them forth, and those who are severe will be tied with iron twine. In other words, following God's verdict, the purveyors of false doctrines, those who are severe, will be restrained. The final couplet reveals, to advance the verdict upon them, prescribed by the splendor of the saints. Praise Yahweh. The entire psalm is prophetic, speaking of the final judgment of nations following the Messiah's return in power and glory. There is no command to fight or kill anyone. Since Islam's principal defense is to claim that Christians have performed no better, especially during the Crusades, I want to bring your attention to two incredibly important historical facts. First, Pope Benedict IX. He reigned in 1033 A.D., precisely 1,000 years after Christ's resurrection. Benedict became like Mohammed, demonic, fixated on the occult, demented, delirious, and lascivious. The church became corrupt, focused on rituals, suppression, and money. With power-hungry men at the helm, it splintered, 
ultimately causing Cleric and King to send men off on foolhardy crusades. The second historical fact is that the Crusaders weren't Christians. They couldn't have been. Four centuries had passed since the last sermon was given in a language common to the people of Europe. The first Bible to be printed in the vulgar tongue was John Wycliffe's, yet it wouldn't find Quill for another four centuries. To be a Christian, one must know Christ. He could not have been known to the men who fought. They carried his symbols, nothing more. Returning to the 7th century in Medina, Muhammad was back on the warpath. Tabari and Ishak. The messenger sent Abdallah out with a detachment of eight men of the immigrants without any Ansari or helpers among them. He wrote a letter but ordered him not to look at it until he had traveled for two days. Then he was to carry out what he was commanded to do. When Abdallah opened the letter, it said, March until you reach Nakla between Mecca and Taif. Lie in wait for the Quraysh there, and find out for us what they are doing. The letter suggests that there was treachery among the treacherous. One or more Muslims was spilling the beans and tipping off the Quraysh before the militants could rob them. Having read the letter, Abdallah said, To hear is to obey. He told his companions, The prophet commanded me to go to Nakla and lie in wait for the Quraysh. To lie in wait is an order to kill. I present Allah as an authority. Here is Quran 9.5. When the prohibited months for fighting are over, slay the pagans wherever you find them. Take them captive and besiege them. Lie in wait for them in every likely place. Abd Allah tells his fellow militants, The prophet has forbidden me to compel you, so whoever desires martyrdom, let him come with me. If not, retreat. I am going to carry out the prophet's orders. Martyrdom, the word that manufactures terrorists faster than the world can rid itself of them, was spoken for the first time. No word has ever held such dire consequences for abused or abuser. The Islamic concept of martyrdom was twisted. Muhammad took a good word and made it bad. Prior to Islam, a martyr willingly sacrificed his or her life to save others, not killed them. A Christian martyr sought nothing. Their lives served as a living witness so that others might know the value of their faith. They died with scripture in their hands, not swords. The Greek word martus, from which martar was derived, means witness. Yet at Muhammad's direction it came to mean murderer. Muslims obtained martyrdom by terrorizing others, murdering millions. Muslim martyrs are mercenaries, wielding swords in pursuit of plunder. I believe this is Satan's signature once again. He is the world's most acclaimed counterfeiter. Martyrdom is good, but not as a pirate. Money is good, but not when it's plundered. Sex is good, but not as an act of pedophilia. Prophets are good, but not when they are motivated by profit. Scripture is good, but not when it's perverted. Prayer is good, but not when one prostrates oneself to the devil. Ishak. His companions went with him. Not one of them stayed behind. A second hadith says, Whoever desires death, let him go on and make his will. I am making my will, and acting on the orders of the messenger of Allah. Tabari. They made their way through the Hijaz, until Saad and Utbah lost a camel, which they were taking turns riding. They stayed behind to look for it. The rest went on until they reached Nakla. A Meccan caravan went past them, carrying raisins, leather, and other merchandise, which the Quraysh traded. When they saw the Muslims, they were afraid of them. Then one of the Muslims came into view. They saw that he had shaved his head, and they felt safer. The Quraysh said, They are on their way to the Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage. There is nothing to fear. The pagan Umrah had become part of Islam. However, shaving one's head was used to venerate Allah, not Allah. So the Quraysh were confused as I am. 
Why would a Muslim militant venerate a pagan idol while pursuing plunder in Allah's name? Ishak. The Muslim raiders consulted one another concerning them, this being the last day of Rajab. Rajab, like Ramadan, was a holy month on the pagan calendar. Fighting, looting, and general mayhem were prohibited. It is troubling that the observance of a pagan rite was a limiting factor, while thievery and murder were not. This says a great deal about the nature of Islam. One of the Muslims said, By Allah, if we leave these people alone tonight, they will get into the haram, the sacred territory of Mecca, and they will be safely out of our reach. If we kill them, we will have killed in the sacred month. The debate was between paganism and criminal behavior. Islam had nothing to do with Muhammad's mission. Tabari. They hesitated and were afraid to advance on them, but then they plucked up courage and agreed to kill as many as they could and to seize what they had with them. This isn't the least bit ambiguous. The first Muslims, Muhammad's disciples, were about to conduct a terrorist raid with the intent to loot and to kill. Waqid ibn Abdallah shot an arrow at Amar and killed him. Uthman bin Abdallah and al-Hakam surrendered, but Nafal ibn Abdallah escaped and eluded them. Then Abdallah and his companions took the caravan and the captives back to Allah's apostle in Medina. Islam had drawn first blood. The score was now Islam 1, infidels 11. The Hadith says, This was the first booty taken by the companions of Muhammad. Reading the passage carefully, we find that there are four slaves to Allah in the raid. Two were Muslims, and two were infidels. It is yet another drop in an ocean of evidence that Allah was a pagan deity, a common rock idol. Abd Allah said of his adventure, Ishaq, our lances drank of Amr's blood and lit the flame of war. Tabari and Ishak. Abdallah told his companions, A fifth of the booty we have taken belongs to the apostle. This was before Allah made surrendering a fifth of the booty taken a requirement. Quran 8.41, a verse from a surah dedicated to booty, says that Muhammad was entitled to one-fifth of whatever Muslims looted. The 69th verse proclaims, The use of such spoils is lawful and good. The fact Abd Allah announced this partitioning of booty years in advance of the Quranic endorsement suggests that the idea was Muhammad's and that he made up a verse to ratify his claim. Money is a powerful motivator. He set aside a fifth of the booty for Allah's messenger and divided the rest between his companions. Allah made the booty permissible. He divided the loot, awarding four-fifths to the men he had allowed to take it. He gave one-fifth to his apostle. If there were any doubt as to why the first Muslim militants were off on their twelfth raid in twelve months, it should have been eliminated with this line. Their mission had nothing to do with religion, nor did Mohammed's. It had always been about the money. Religion was simply a tool, a veil, a distraction, a means to legitimize murder and mayhem. Muhammad's raiders weren't religious zealots. They were mercenaries at best, pirates at worst. And lest we forget, they were now murderers, kidnappers, and thieves. When the raiders returned to Yathrib, they were blindsided by a raging controversy. Both the immigrants and the helpers were horrified, deeply troubled by the breach of the holy month protections. Even the most despicable bandits refrained from thievery during Rajab. And I suppose they may have been bothered by the fact that they had murdered, robbed, and kidnapped their kin. This societal disdain put the wannabe prophet in a quandary. Muhammad was broke, and poor dictators don't last very long. But if he accepted the booty, he would trash his already shaky religious credentials. He was on his heels and teetering from the Karish bargain, the satanic verses, the night's journey, and the migration of shame. Stooping to the level of a scoundrel, a murderous pirate, a two-bit terrorist, so desperate for money that he would steal during Rajab, was one blow too many. So what to do? 
His first ploy was to betray his troops. Something Muslim suicide bombers should keep in mind the next time they contemplate murdering their way to paradise. Tabari. When they reached the prophet, he said, I did not order you to fight in the sacred month. He impounded the caravan and the two captives and refused to take anything from them. The prospect of martyrdom and lying in wait confirms that Muhammad had sent his Muslim raiders out to fight, as did the requirement of making out their wills. The division of spoils agreement indicates that he had given his authorization for them to steal. The lying prophet was buying time, which is why he didn't send the booty back. He was trying to find a way to keep the money and maintain his dwindling prestige. When Allah's messengers said this, they were aghast and thought that they were doomed. The Muslims rebuked them severely for what they had done. They said, You have done what you were not commanded to do, and have fought in the sacred month. To salvage his reputation, and thus cling to his position of power, Muhammad made his men scapegoats. His letter confirmed his complicity. He had sent them out in Rajab, the idolater's sacred month. The act made him an accessory to murder and a thief. The denial made him a pagan and a liar, something far more lethal to a person pretending to be a prophet. Tabari and Ishak The Quraysh said, Muhammad and his companions have violated the sacred month, shed blood, seized property, and taken men captive. The polytheists spread lying slander concerning him, saying, Muhammad claims that he is following obedience to Allah, yet he is the first to violate the holy month and to kill our companion in Rajab. The pagans knew that breaking treaties, murder, kidnapping, and thievery were wrong. It's a shame that Islam's lone prophet didn't. I find it especially revealing that when the Meccans told the truth about what had just happened, They were called lying slanderers. This has devastating implications for the totality of the Quran. Its second most repetitive theme is the never-ending argument. The Meccans said that Muhammad was a demon-possessed liar, not a prophet. They said that he had forged the Quran to serve his personal ambitions. They appeared to be right, and yet Islam's dark spirit called them lying slanderers. In this circumstance, the Meccans were absolutely right, and yet Muhammad deployed the same strategy. At the very least, this suggests that the Hadith and Quran had the same speechwriter, the same agenda, and the same wanton disregard for truth. It also tells us that those who knew this prophet far better than we could possibly know him today saw him as a terrorist raider and a moral thug and as a liar. Tabari, the Muslims who were still in Mecca refuted this. It was embarrassing. It meant that they had placed their trust in a man unworthy of it. Ishak, the Jews, seeing in this an omen unfavorable to Muhammad, said, Muslims killing Meccans means war is kindled. There was much talk of this. However, Allah turned it to their disadvantage. When the Muslims repeated what the Jews had said, Allah revealed a Quran to his messenger. They question you with regard to warfare in the sacred month. Say, war therein is serious, but keeping people from Islam, from the sacred month, and driving them out is more serious with Allah. This became Quran 2, 217. The Muslims now knew that seduction was worse than killing. Considering the facts, this was an inane excuse for violating treaties, kidnapping, theft, and murder. The Meccan merchants were minding their business. They weren't seducing anyone. Once again, the prophet behaves badly, and it's the pagan's fault, not his own. Ishak, when the Quran passage concerning this matter was revealed, and Allah relieved Muslims of their fear and anxiety, Muhammad took possession of the caravan and prisoners. The Quraysh sent him a ransom, but the Prophet said, We will not release them to you on payment of ransom until our companions, Saad and Utba, get back, for we are afraid you may harm them. If you kill them, we will kill your friends. 
They came back, however, and the Prophet released the prisoners on payment of ransom. When the Quran authorization came down to Muhammad, Abdallah and his companions were relieved, because, and they became anxious for an additional reward. They said, Will this raid be counted as part of the reward promised to Muslim combatants? So Allah sent down this Quran. Those who believe and have fought in Allah's cause may receive Allah's mercy. Allah made the booty permissible. He divided the loot, awarding four-fifths to the men he had allowed to take it. He gave one-fifth to his apostle. Mercy for murderers. Rewards for raiders. Loot for profiteers. Allah's cause has been defined for the first time, and is directly linked to a terrorist raid, one in which Muslim militants attacked civilians. They committed capital murder kidnapping, and armed robbery. Islam was not preached. Instead, Islam was used to motivate the bandits and reward the prophet. The religion prompted barbarism rather than discourage it. This incident alone destroys Islam's religious credentials, Muhammad's authority, and Allah's credibility. God justifying criminal acts to satisfy a prophet's financial lust is unfathomable. If we are to believe Muhammad, Allah approved murder, terror, thievery, and kidnapping for ransom. Forget for a moment that this dark spirit was demented. This is immoral. An immoral God cannot be trusted. An immoral deity isn't worthy of a religion, devotion, sacrifice, or martyrdom. The same is true of an immoral prophet. Muhammad had sent out armed brigades in search of Quraysh hoping to terrorize them and rob their caravans. When his militants succeeded, he betrayed his mercenaries to save his own hide, yet he still took the money. He threatened to kill his kin and ransom them back to his tribe. Then he claimed that his God approved his hellish behavior, which is the biggest crime of all. The only thing more devastating than a man professing situational scriptures to legitimize terror murder, robbery, and kidnapping for ransom is to lure billions to their doom by implying these words were inspired by God. By so doing, Muhammad confirmed my theory. Islam was nothing more than the profitable prophet plan. According to the Sira, Muhammad was a con man. There have been millions of murderers, millions of kidnappers, millions of terrorists. There have been millions of sexual predators. Thieves are a dime a dozen. There have been a score of men who have done these things while claiming to be anointed by God. Yet only one invented a religion and falsified scripture to satiate his demonic cravings. This is why Muhammad, Islam's lone prophet, qualifies as the most evil man to have ever lived.
Verses of Violence in the Quran. Quran Book 2, verses 191 to 193. And slay them wherever ye find them, and drive them out of the places whence they drove you out, for persecution of Muslims is worse than slaughter of non-believers. But if they desist, then lo, Allah is forgiving and merciful, and fight them until persecution is no more, and religion is for Allah. Quran, Book 3, verse 151. Soon shall we cast terror into the hearts of the unbelievers, for that they joined companions with Allah, for which he had sent no authority. Quran Book 4, verse 89 They but wish that ye should reject faith, as they do, and thus be on the same footing as they. But take not friends from their ranks until they flee in the way of Allah from what is forbidden. But if they turn renegades, seize them and slay them wherever ye find them. And in any case, take no friends or helpers from their ranks. Quran Book 5, verse 33 The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall have a grievous chastisement. Quran Book 8, verse 12 I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve, Therefore strike off their heads, and strike off every fingertip of them. Quran Book 9, verse 5 So when the sacred months have passed away, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captives, and besiege them, and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Then if they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, leave their way free to them. Quran Book 9, verse 29 Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they are Jews, until they pay the blood money with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Quran Book 9 verse 30 And the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before. May Allah destroy them, how they are turned away. Quran Book 17 verse 16 And when we wish to destroy a town, we send our commandment to the people of it who lead easy lives, but they transgress therein. Thus the word proves true against it, so we destroy it with utter destruction. Quran Book 33 verses 60 to 62 if the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is a disease and the alarmists in the city do not cease, we verily shall urge thee on against them, then they will be your neighbours in it but a little while. Accursed, they will be seized wherever found and slain with a fierce slaughter. Bukhari 52, 177 Allah's Apostle said, The hour will not be established until you fight with the Jews, and the stone behind which a Jew will be hiding will say, O Muslim! There is a Jew behind me, so kill him. Bukhari 52, 256 The Prophet was asked whether it was permissible to attack the pagan warriors at night with the probability of exposing their women and children to danger. The Prophet replied, They, the women and children, are from them. Bukhari 52, 220 Allah's Apostle said, I have been made victorious with terror. Tabari 7, 97 the morning after the murder of Ashraf, the Prophet declared, Kill any Jew who falls under your power. Tabari 9, 69 Killing unbelievers is a small matter to us. Ibn Ishaq Hisham, 327 Allah said, A Prophet must slaughter before collecting captives. A slaughtered enemy is driven from the land. Muhammad, you crave the desires of this world, its goods and the ransom captives would bring but Allah desires killing them to manifest the religion.
لماذا يفجر شاب مسلم في ريعان شبابه يمتلك الحياة بعرضها ووسعها كي يعيش من أجلها كيف ولماذا يفجر نفسه في حافلة مليئة بالركاب في حافلة مليئة بالأبرياء طيب. الدين في بلادنا هو المصدر الوحيد للتربية وهو المنهل الوحيد الذي شرب منه هذا الإرهابي حتى ارتوى هو لم يولد إرهابيا ولم يصبح إرهابيا بين ليلة وضحاها التعاليم الإسلامية هي التي ساهمت في حياكة نسيجه الفكري خيطا خيطا ولم تسمح للمصادر الأخرى أقصد المصادر العلمية أن تلعب دورا في هذا التصنيع هذه التعاليم هي التي شوهت هذا الإرهابي وقتلت إنسانيته وليس هو الذي شوهها وأساء فهمها كما يدعي بعض الجاهلين عندما تقرأ على طفل لم يتجاوز بعد سنوات عمره الأولى الآية التي تقول أن يقتلوا أو يصلبوا أو تقطع أيديهم وأرجلهم من خلاف بغض النظر عن تفسير تلك الآية وبغض النظر عن أسباب نزولها والزمن الذي نزلت فيه تكون قد خطوت الخطوة الأولى في طريق صناعة إرهابي كبير لقد تساءلت الضيفة من أمريكا كيف يقدم الشاب على تفجير حافلة ليتها تساءلت كيف يقدم رئيس على قنبلة شعب آمن في العراق كيف يقدم رئيس على مساعدة سفاح فلسطين المحتلة لماذا لم تسأل أين نشأ هتلر الذي قتل وقتل نحو ستين خمسين مليون بريء لماذا لم تسأل أين تربى الذين ألقوا بقنبلتين اثنتين ذريتين على اليابان من الذي قتل ثلاثة ملايين فيتنامي بريء من الذي أباد الهنود الحمر من الذي حافظ على الاستعمار إلى يومنا هذا من الذي أجر الحرب الإسبانية الأهلية التي أتت على ستمائة ألف نسمة خلال ستة وثلاثين شهرا لماذا لا نتساءل هكذا من الذي يملك أكثر من خمستاشر ألف رأس نووي المسلمون أم غير المسلمين المسلمون أم الأمريكان المسلمون أم الأوروبيون نريد أن نجاب أين تربى بوش لتقول لنا بأن التربية هي التي تجعل من الإنسان مجرما القتل إرهاب في كل زمان ومكان ولكن عندما يأتي بفرمان من الله الأمر يختلف الحروب الصليبية التي يتحدث عنها أستاذنا هذه الحروب جاءت بعد التعاليم الإسلامية وجاءت كردة فعل لهذه التعاليم إنها قانون الفعل وردة الفعل التعاليم الإسلامية حضت على رفض الآخر حضت على إلغاء الآخر حضت على قتل الآخر ألم تحض على قتل اليهود والنصارى؟ إذا سمعنا أن قبيلة في أقصى أقاصي السين لديها كتاب مقدس وليها تعاليم تصر على قتل المسلمين هل سيقف المسلمين مكتوفي الأيدي حيال هذه التعاليم؟ الحروب الصليبية جاءت بعد التعاليم الإسلامية وعندما, كانت التع... وعندما نزلت هذه التعاليم الإسلامية لم تكن أمريكا على سطح الأرض ولم تكن إسرائيل في فلسطين لماذا لم يتكلم عن الفتوحات الصليبية عن الفتوحات الإسلامية التي تمت قبل كل هذه الحروب الذي يتكلم عنها لماذا لم يتكلم عندما اقتمح مطارق بن زياد بجيوشه الأندلس وقال لهم البحر من أمامكم والعدو من ورائكم كيف تقتحم بلدا آمنا وتعتبر جميع سكانه الآمنين تعتبرهم أعداء لك بمجرد أنك تمتلك الحق أن تنشر دينك هل يتم نشر الدين بالسيف والقتال؟ من الذي اخترع الاسترقاق في القرون المتأخرة؟ من الذي استعمر الآخر؟ أنحن أم هم؟ هل الجزائر هي التي استعمرت فرنسا؟ أم فرنسا هي التي استعمرت الجزائر؟ هل مصر هي التي استعمرت إنجلترا؟ أم أن إنجلترا هي التي استعمرت مصر؟ نحن الضحية أنا لا أقول بأن ضرب الأبرياء شيء جميل أقول بأن الأبرياء ينبغي أن نحميهم جميعا ولكن في نفس الوقت علينا أن نبدأ بأبرياء المسلمين 
أبرياؤنا بالملايين وأبرياؤكم وهم أبرياء بالعشرات أو بالمئات وفي أقصى الحالات بالآلاف هل تستطيع أن تفسر لي قتل مائة ألف طفل وأمرأة ورجل في الجزائر بأبشع أساليب القتل هل تستطيع أن تفسر لي قتل خمسة ألف مدني في سوريا هل تستطيع أن تفسر لي الجريمة النكراء في مدرسة المدفعية في مدينة حلب السورية هل تستطيع أن تفسر جريمة حي الأسبكية في مدينة دمشق السورية هل تستطيع أن تفسر هجوم الإرهابيين إلى قرية الكشح الآمنة في صعيد مصر وذبح 21 فلاح قطي هل تستطيع أن تفسر لي ماذا يجري في أندونيسيا وتركيا ومصر مع العلم أن هذه الدول الإسلامية وعارضت التدخل الأمريكي في العراق وليس لها جيوش في العراق لكنها لم تسلم من إرهابهم كيف تفسر هذه الظواهر وقد حدثت في بلاد عربية هل كانت انتقاما من أمريكا؟ هل كانت انتقاما من إسرائيل؟ أم كانت إشباعا لغرائزهم الحيوانية المتوحشة التي أثارتها تعاليم تحض على رفض الآخر تحض على قتل الآخر تحض على إلغاء الآخر عندما قتل عندما قبر صدام حسين 300 ألف شيعي وكردي تحت الأرض أحياء لم نسمع مسلما واحدا يحتج على هذا العمل ألم يكن سكوتكم اعترافا بشرعية هذا القتل؟ ماذا تريدني؟ هل تريدني أن أطعن بالمجتمع الأمريكي؟ أنا لم أقل يوما بأن أمريكا هي مدينة أفلاطون الخالدة ولكن قلت وبصراحة أنها مدينة وفاء سلطان الخالدة مثالية المجتمع الأمريكي كانت كافية لأن تتيح لي أن أمارس إنسانيتي مع الهنود الحمر مع الهنود الحمر مع الهنود الحمر مع ماذا تقول عن الهنود الحمر؟ مع ماذا تقول في الهنود الحمر؟ بس دقيقة يا دكتور كريستوف كولومبوس اكتشف أمريكا عام 1492 قامت أمريكا عام 1776 بعد حوالي 300 عام لا تستطيع أن تتهم أمريكا كدستور ونظام وكدولة بأنها هي التي قتلت الهنود الحمر عندما وضعت القرآن والأحاديث والكتب الإسلامية تحت عدسة مجهري توصلت إلى قناعة مطلقة لا يمكن لا يمكن أن يقرأ إنسان السيرة النبوية لمحمد ويؤمن بها ويخرج إلى الحياة إنسانا سليما معافى نفسيا وعقليا أن تذكر الطريقة التي قتل بها السيدة عزماء بنت مروان عندما قطع أتباعه جسدها إربا إربا وهي ترضع طفلها والمشكلة عادوا إليه يكبرون فقال لا يتناطح بها عنزان أنت تعرف أن الماعز تتناطح لأتفه الأسباب ولكن عند محمد قتل امرأة مرضعة سبب أتفه من أن يتناطح به عنزان هل هذا نبي من عند الله؟ يعتريني الأسف الشديد عندما تسمح الجزيرة لمخلوق معتوه إرهابي كالقرضاوي كي ينفث من خلال من برها سمومه ويبث فتاويه الإرهابية وسرسراته كانت العبارات التي استخدمها ضدي قد حرضت الكثير من الشباب المسلم المغسول الدماغ المعصوب العيون المبرمج على الكره ليمطرني بوابل من الشتائم والتهديدات بعد الحلقة مباشرة التي تناول بها ظهوري على الجزيرة عندما يعتبر الإسلام المرأة ناقصة عقل وأنا أطحن مصداقية هذا القول في تلك الحالة الإسلام يهاجمني وأنا أرد هجومه 
عندما يدعو الإسلام إلى قتل الآخر الذي لا يؤمن به وأنا أطحض مصداقية هذا القول في تلك الحالة الإسلام يهاجمني وأنا أرد هجومه أنا لا أهاجم أنا أنتقد الإسلام ولكن للأسف الشديد نحن ضحايا التربية الإسلامية لا نرى في النقد إلا هجوما أنا دوما أركز على اللغة لغة الإسلام لغة الإسلام لغة سلبية ميتة مشحونة بالعنف والغضب والحقد والعنصرية الإنسان ناتج لغوي وهو حصيلة ما يسمعه في حياته من لغة سلبية وإيجابية فإن غلبت اللغة السلبية في حياته خرج إلى الحياة إنسانا سلبيا نزقا رافضا غير منتج وإن غلبت اللغة الإيجابية خرج إلى الحياة إنسانا إيجابيا سعيدا منتجا ولذلك لغة الإسلام السلبية فشلت لم تنتج إنسانا يستطيع أن يتفاعل مع الحياة بعفوية وبإيجابية أنجبت إنسانا سلبيا لو ألقينا نظرة على المجتمعات الإسلامية نستطيع أن نرى ما استطاع أن يفعله هذا الرجل السلبي أنا لا أعتبر الإسلام دينا من خلال مفهوم لدي الإسلام عقيدة سياسية تفرض نفسها بالقوة أي عقيدة على سطح الأرض تدعو إلى قتل من لا يؤمن بها هي ليست عقيدة ليست دينا وإنما عقيدة شمولية تفرض نفسها بالقوة عندما أقرأ آية على سبيل المثال والزاني والزاني فاجلدوا كل واحد منهما ما أتجلد لا تأخذكم بهما شفق أو رأفة لا أرى في تلك الآية أي روحانية عندما تستطيع العقيدة أن تجرد أتباعها من آخر ذرة رأفة تكون قد جردتهم أيضا من روحانيتهم المسيح رمز السلام لم يحمل سيفا لم يقطع رقبة لم يكفر إنسانا أما المشكلة في الإسلام إذا عدنا إذا فعلنا كما فعل المسيحيون في القرون الوسطى وأردنا أن نعود إلى حياة محمد وأفعاله وأقواله سنكون في ورطة أكبر من الورطة التي نعيشها اليوم وسننتهي بأسامة بن لادن وأمثاله أقرأ حياة محمد ماذا تجد فيها غزواته وزيجاته وأحاديثه التي يقشعر البدن لبعض تلك الأحاديث يقشعر البدن عندما يقول جنة المرأة تحت قدم زوجها التعاليم الإسلامية استفحلت داخل جماجم المسلمين ولا أجد طريقة إلا بفتح تلك الجماجم وتنظيف الأدمغة من الخلايا السرطانية التي تهدد حياتها عندما زحف الشعب السوري إلى السفارة الدنماركية وحرقها حرق قلبي معه لماذا؟ لماذا؟ الشعب السوري يموت جوعا الإنسان السوري اللي هو صاحب حضارة يلهث وراء رغيف الخبز فلماذا لا يسحف إلى قصر رئيسه وقد بلغت ميزانيته الأربعين بليون دولار في, الـ في, الـ في, الـ في الـ البنوك الأوروبية معلش. ويحرق هذا القصر بمن فيه زحفوا إلى السفارة الدنماركية وأعطوا الغرب صورة غير صحيحة عن الشعب السوري الأخلاقي والحضاري ولذلك أصف سلوكهم بالهمجية والتخلف الصراع الإسرائيلي الفلسطيني صراع ديني أنا مع القضية الفلسطينية أنا مع الأطفال الفلسطينيين عذابات النساء الفلسطينيات تقض مضجعي أنا لا أستطيع أن أدوس على نمنة فهل يعقل أن أكون ضدهم؟ لا يمكن لا يمكن هنالك خلاف سياسي 
عليهم أن يسألوا قاداتهم والدور التي تلعبه تلك القادات القيادات في حل تلك المشكلة لكن هناك جزور دينية للمشكلة نعم. كنت أقرأ في كتاب إسلامي منذ أسبوع أو أسبوعين قرأت قصة صغيرة تقول كان محمد يمشي مع بعض أتباعه فسمعوا ضجة فقالوا له ما هذا يا رسول الله قال إنهم اليهود يتعذبون في قبورهم بغض النظر عن الخلافات يومها بين محمد ويهود واليهود هذا القول يشير إلى أن قبورهم كانت في قبور أجدادهم كانت في السعودية مصبوط هم أبناء المنطقة البرهان على أنهم أبناء المنطقة يأتي من الكتب الإسلامية ومن القرآن نفسه المشكلة مع المسلمين أنهم لا يميزون بين نبيهم وبين أنوفهم فعندما تنتقد محمد وتنتقد أفعاله وأعماله وتنتقد سيرته وكأنك, وكأنك جدعت إنف